Okay. Um, welcome in, everybody, to uh, the next edition of the Sports Fanatic News Podcast. This is going to be a all sports encompassing, kind of like your sports center type radio show, where we're going to talk about the different sports within 25 to 30 minutes for you guys. Um, we're going to start with baseball, but first I'm going to turn it over to my co host in case he has any links he wants to share or um, anything of that nature. So, Andrew, w- welcome. Uh, Still good morning. It's 11.56, so good morning um, as we're recording this. How you doing? I'm doing well. Glad to be back. Um, excited to get back, talk about some sports. What about you? The same thing. Yeah, I'm excited to get to uh, talk about some sports. And by the way, I hit that record button quick so people know. That's why I came in with an odd intro because I didn't even mean to click on it. And then it just <laughs> said recording in progress. But, because both off guard. <laughs> yeah, but um, so that's kind of what happened with the Zoom technology. Um, but we're gonna get into baseball first and foremost. The Phillies had a good game yesterday. I thought Aaron Nola pitched really well. Um, he really shouldn't have gave up anything in the first inning because Kyle Schwarber lost a fly ball, and then the next guy hit a triple. So he should have gave up one run, actually, because then the next guy hit a triple, and then there was a sack fly. So he should have gave up one run in that inning. But instead, he gave up two because they scored a triple that basically donked off of the head of Kyle Schwarber uh, as a triple instead of an error for some reason. So that happened. Uh, that was one of those calls in the preseason. I'm like, it's the preseason. I don't really care, but I don't agree with because – even if there's sun, if you're literally under the fly ball and it flubs off your glove, that's an error. That's not – like, that's not, oh, my God, the sun's in the – like, yes, it is, but I've seen Jake Cave, one of our other outfielders for this year, do really good at being – well, he's left-handed, so he would come like this. He's really good at shielding the sun on his glove. He's probably one of our better fielding outfielders. That's why I hope he makes the team – because we need to replace Nick Castellanos in the outfield by the seventh inning. Nick Castellanos is your Pat Burrow. So, like, you hey, here's gold really glove in the playoffs. want him to be in that outfield. Like, he's the reason somebody got a triple the other day, because he couldn't pick the ball up out of the corner. He tried to pick it up and muffed it, and then a guy got a single with an E. No, no, no. He got a double with an E charge to Castellanos because he muffed it in the corner. So Nick's obviously more known for his hitting, and we think that's going to come more this year. But a surprise player I want to talk about is Scott Kingery. Um, Because Scott Kingery is kind of this long-forgotten son of the Phillies, and they changed his swing around, and he's actually having a really good spring. I think he actually has a chance to make the team because – we lost Matt Veerling to Detroit, and then he went off against us, of course. Um, and then uh, we also lost Nick Maton to Detroit, so you don't have as much depth in that infield or outfield, and Kingery can play all of it minus catching. So he basically would just have two Edmundo Sosas on the team, except for Edmundo Sosa is more better than Scott Kingery, but... Scott Kingery is significantly faster than Edmundo Sosa, so I like the way that if Kingery makes the team, it adds an extra steal factor, especially with those bigger bases. It adds an extra steal factor into the team because I think you're going to see – this is just my opinion. This is my wrap-up point on this. I think you're going to see base runners run more this year because they have that extra three inches to slide at. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Uh, the The whole base is, I think that's going to add a whole new dynamic to the, to the game. Um, I think it's going to bring back some of those steals. I agree with you completely on that. Um, I don't know. Kinger's an interesting case. I don't know if they'll give him the spot on the team with his struggles in the past. It might take him to prove it uh, in the first couple weeks or so in the minors before they make the call. I think with the way spring training's gone elsewhere – I think you got some guys like Jay Cave, like you mentioned. Um, I don't think anyone expected him to hit the ball as well. I think he's making a, a strong case for himself. And if he's going to replace a guy like Matt Brown, I know he, he kind of played all over the place too, but he was mainly an outfielder. So I think Cave will get that as and Mundo Sosa will get that yeah. game type role. Um, so I, I think it could go a lot of different directions 
Um, we but, also have John Hicks, who we picked up from the Pirates, who's a first baseman, not the Pirates. Yeah, yeah. Um, not the Pirates. We picked up from Detroit, I think, who's a uh, catcher slash first baseman. So he's been doing pretty well in spring, too. Derek Hall's having a pretty good spring. So there's a lot of people that have to fit into a small fold. So well, then, you have to figure that out. Then let's not forget about the guy you got in the trade with Soto um, when you gave up Matt Merling and um... – uh, Nick made time. You also bring in uh, Cody Clements, who, who was a once highly talented prospect, and he's having a fantastic spring training. Um, that's true, and he can play all over, over too. So, he's yeah, a, that, guy, that that's he's a guy that might – him and Kangaroo will, will play out. And uh, I would give the edge to Clemens right now. I think he's playing a little bit better than Kangaroo. So, uh, we'll see how it goes, though. I, I think that's something special. About that's this, all good, yeah. About I this think... Philly team, though, is we haven't had this much depth in a while. So I think going into this season, that's one thing to be excited about is the depth of this club. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I was going to say on your previous point, I think what is going to come down to Kingery is how much time does Rob Thompson want people to run? Because Cody Clemens ain't fast. I'm probably faster than Cody Clemens. So, like, that's the, that's the big difference between them two. Cody Clemens could probably steal like Chase Utley did. And, like, just time the pitcher perfectly and get a couple bags that way. But he's kind of like in the Jake Cave territory. They're not really fast. They're just good fielders that you hope hit well enough to be in the majors, basically. Well, yeah, my count, my, my point on that, too, is you already have a bunch of guys in your lineup that can steal. Trey Turner is very capable of uh, stealing. Bryson Stott's proven he's capable of stealing. Brandon Marsh, he's going to be the center fielder. He's capable of yeah. stealing. Um, obviously, when Bryce Harper comes back, he's capable of stealing. And last year, you saw JT Romuto steal a bunch. I think he was close to leading the team in stolen bases, if not leading the team in stolen and bases. And then Garrett so, Stubbs can steal, too, or backup catcher. Yeah. So, I, I don't know how much that speed will come into play because um, you're already filled there. I, I think Sosa's capable of stealing a little bit, too. And, uh, I, I mean – I don't know. It'll be interesting. I'm pulling for Kingery because I think it's a shame how he kind of fell out of the rotation there, and hopefully he's able to find a way back in it. Um, but we'll see. I think there's a lot of stuff open still. I mean, the Phillies somehow secretly had Reese Hoskins go go through surgery this offseason. That was like the quietest thing, and we find out about that a few days ago. He's supposed to make his first start, I think, this afternoon. No, um, no, he played He played last game. He played last game. Okay, so his second game. start. This afternoon, so like we'll see how well and ready he is for for opening day, and and maybe Hall could see some time. I there. think he got a hit. I'm pretty sure he got a hit, Reese. Yeah, he went two for two yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I thought um, he got it. But maybe he's a guy that, or I mean, depending on how his legs feeling, you might have to platoon him for a little bit. Um, maybe DH or let Hall play first or something like that. So. There's a lot of question marks. I mean, obviously, it's going to be an exciting year coming off. Did you the, see that uh, one ball that Derek Hall – just on the topic of Derek Hall, did you see that one ball when it was the split squad game? They showed a highlight of it. He hit it off of the facade that's all the way in center field. Yeah. In the – in the um, like one of the bigger um, spring training ballparks, he drilled the like above the batter's eye. <laughs> like, like he 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 has some power, Derek Hall. So I kind of hope he makes the team because we've been talking about how we already have speed. We could use a little bit more pop in our lineup instead of just single hitters and doubles hitters. Yeah, no question about it. And again, while it's a lot to be excited about, obviously bringing in Turner coming off the World Series run, you make the trade for Soto, another highly talented reliever, um, a lot of relief depth in here. There are still a lot of question marks, and one of the biggest things will be the health of this team. Obviously, missing Harper probably till the All Star break. Again, Hoskins, how much you're gonna have to platoon him? Yes. So there are there are a lot of question marks, and I think uh, Dave Dombrowski and company did a great job for filling depth here for this team. And I think the depth will be able to carry this team until those guys are fully healthy. Except for when they played Boston, apparently, because they lost fifteen to three to my other team. So everyone's got. Yeah, uh, but the 
I think we'll move on now from the Phillies. We covered the Phillies. If you had to pick right now, this is a hard question because we haven't even got through what the rosters are going to be for the season for any of these teams. But if you had to pick a World Series favorite going into the season, who would your World Series favorite be? See, yeah, that's a tough question. Um, obviously, it's tough because I think the NL World Series representative will come out of the NL East. I think talent-wise, the Phillies, Braves, and Mets are the three best teams in the National League. And what's crazy about that is you're probably without <laughs> question going to get one of those uh, as a wild card, obviously with the division winner, and maybe steal that second wild card spot too. Or going against those two top teams, you might keep one of them out of the playoffs. So it's going to be interesting how that rolls. Um, I think if I had a lean based off talent, I'm probably going to – you might lean brave still. Um, I'm coming off the, yes. the division crown and everything. But, listen, there's no reason the Phillies can't get it done. I mean, you were there last year. You only got better this offseason with Trey Turner, Soto, and, and everybody yes. else. So, I'm tempted to say the Phillies again because you got only gotten better and you're, defend, you're the defending National League champions. Um, in the American League, though, I – I like what Toronto did this offseason. Um, I could see them making a run. I'm not saying World Series. I know I'm kind of going on here a little bit, but I'll tell you what. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I think the Angels had a very underrated offseason. I expect them to be in the playoffs. I think this is their year to break the playoff drought. But in terms of World Series, I'll take the Phillies against the um, – I'm gonna go Phillies. I go yeah, Phillies. Put that down a bit more. Yeah. I go Phillies Yankees rematch. Mo nice. As of now, exactly. we'll see how the rosters. See, I think injuries, but. it's not even necessarily. I love the roster of my other team. It's just that's the Boston Red Sox way. Forget what you're doing for a season, and then just come back and win the World Series or get to the World Series. Like that's just the way of the Red Sox in the 2000 era. It's like. Guys, what did we do wrong last year? And then they just come back with these random other guys that are on the team. And you're like, where did this guy come from? And then he's hitting like 300 and you're like, oh, okay, whatever. Like, like J.D., we never thought would be as good as J- – we knew J.D. Martinez was a good player. But nobody ever foresaw what J.D. Martinez has done for Boston yeah. his time there. Like, he turned into a mega superstar in Boston. So – like, I think they have a very good developmental system that makes not top prospects look like top prospects. And the Phillies are starting to kind of pull from that because now you have your, like, Matt Williams of the world that can play all those different positions, and he's fast as lightning, so it adds speed to you have your uh, Andrew Painters of the world who hopefully is fine with his elbow. Uh, we haven't got an update on that yet. And then you have your Mick Abels of the world who are all the future. So the Phillies are starting to get to that. But Boston's kind of been doing that for the whole 2000s era, just getting these guys off of scrap heaps and then turning them into like a good player for them. So I'm excited that the Phillies finally woke up and realized that's something you're supposed to do, like pick up the Cody Clemens of the world, like we mentioned earlier, pick up the Jay Caves of the world, because they just need to fit into the right clubhouse and they'll be a good player. Yeah, hey, no question about it. I think that's something they lacked last year going into that postseason. Is when a guy was struggling, you really didn't have anyone picking him up there on the bench there to give a guy a day off. It was, you had to play your starters every day. So, again, I, I think they did a great job this offseason, and, and I fully expect a – a fun year and, and some more red October. Yeah. All right. Well, that was our baseball talk. Now we'll move on to hockey real quick, just because I have the magazine next to me that has the quote in it. So that's easier for me. <laughs> um, so Matt Coronado is one of the flames top prospects. Anybody that's watching from Calgary probably knows who this guy is because they're obsessed with him. He's trying to round out his talent at Harvard. Harvard University, Harvard. Um, 
Let me see if I can read this in a Boston accent. The most important thing in hockey is really about winning games. <laughs> that's what uh that's what Matt Coronado has said, and he's a born winner. He's a natural born winner. Obviously, if you go to Harvard, you're also one of the smartest people on the planet. So you got that going for you also. <laughs> Plus, uh, he's a guy that n- I wouldn't call him the one of the best skaters from that draft, but he's improved his skating because I've had the privilege of watching Harvard on television quite a few times. So they they are a fast paced team. They like having guys that are quick witted with the puck. Jimmy VC, of course, is a thing that someone's going to come out and say, "Oh, well, Jimmy VC never really made it." That's one person. Just because Jimmy VC never really stuck on in the NHL doesn't mean Matt Coronado is going to come in and do the same thing. I think he's actually going to have a really good season, and that's kind of going to be the guy to look out for towards the end of uh, the um. What was I thinking of? Towards the end of the season, when like their college season ends, so like they can come in and he can play the the games at the end of the season when Harvard seasons end. So I think he's a guy you could look for to do that because I'm pretty sure he's not going to make the team. I think he's going back to Harvard again. So, um, he's a guy you could probably see in like the last ten to fifteen games of the season, just get the straight call up. And then, secondly, we're due – I opened to a random team's page, so that's how we're going to do this. Um, I opened to Dallas Stars. We're going to talk about one prospect each time we do this on Sunday. Uh, Logan Stankhoven uh, – excuse me, Logan Stankhoven um, yeah. from Comma Loops. He – as described by Hockey Magazine, Stan Coben was one of the last cuts for Dallas last season, and he's odds to bet to make the start next season. White says Stan Coben, whose Blazers host the Memorial Cup this year, performed well for Canada in the WJC, which is the World Junior Classic for people that don't know what the WJC is. Um, both are important for him as a team leader playing in all situations. Because he's the um, captain of his team in the Blazers. Um, playing in all situations. While note, Stackhoven has a loaded skill set. And you should expect him to play regularly in the 23-24 season. So next season is when you should expect him to play regularly. And he's also a center. I forgot to mention his position. So Dallas is getting even stronger down the middle. And they're already one of the stronger teams down the middle. And now their top prospect is a center. And not to mention Maverick Bjork, who's one of my favorite players as a prospect, is their third top prospect, and he's a center. So Dallas is really – we're going to get the Stanley Cup favorites later, but I'll give a pitch out here. Dallas is one of mine because they play such a good defensive game that moves into their offense. It's like watching a team that just – really focuses on structure, structure, structure. That's the Dallas Stars. The other team that really focuses on structure, structure, structure in the West is Colorado. And then in the East, we obviously have the almighty Boston Bruins. So if I had to pick my cup favorite in general, it would be the almighty Boston Bruins. But I would say they're going to play, if I had to pick now, Dallas and or – Car- not Carolina, Dallas and or Colorado, depending how those playoff matchups go, because they might have to play each other in an earlier round. But that's kind of how I would have my Stanley Cup favorites ranked. Well, well, let me rank them. Boston's first, Dallas is second, Colorado's third. Yeah, no, I think there's uh, – I-, I think the Bruins, like you said, are the mighty favorites. I do like Toronto. I think they'd be my second team. I know they're another team that comes out of the East, and that's a tough call with them having to beat the Bruins. But um, there's something about the East this year. I mean, you look at them compared to the West, you got five teams there in the East side ahead of the, the Stars. Um, 
So it's kind of wild to think about there. And that's another team. I mean, Colorado struggled at, at certain points this year. Obviously, they're trying to uh, get back to the cup this season. But um, uh, it's a tough call. I, I think I like the Bruins there. And then um, I think Toronto would be my other team uh, to look out for for potentially getting there. I do think the uh, I think the Kings could come out of the West though. They've been there before. They've mm. they've uh, they've they're getting hot at the right time. I, I like I like the way the Kings are going to the end of the season. I actually am a fan of the Kings. They're one of the other teams that I like watching just because I've been a fan of Anze Kopitar ever since he came into the league. So he's kind of they're kind of one of the teams that I always tend to try to keep an eye on. So I I would agree with that. I just can't trust Toronto because they always lose in the postseason. So until Toronto proves to me they can get out of the first round in, consistently or for for the first time in a long time, that's when I'll go, okay, now they're out of the first round. Now I'll put them as a cup favorite because Toronto can't be trusted in the postseason. Like they, they, they'll do great in the regular season and then just forget the whole fundamentals of what they were doing in the postseason. But I agree – from Toronto's baseline of how they look on the ice, they should be a Stanley Cup favorite. I can just never trust the Maple Leafs because of their past experiences. Signal failure, 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 not success. So, I feel like the Stars are kind of like that too, though. Like I get they made it out of the first round and stuff, but that seems like they never can get get over that one obstacle. Whether no matter what year it is. That's um, a good there's, point. Year, there's a year I thought they're going to get by the Blues. I think they were up two one maybe in that series. The Blues come back and win that series uh, a couple times. I think they lost the Blues here in recent years and get knocked out. But I don't know. Stars are Stars are a team like that that uh, I'm skeptical with too to get past. But I feel like outside the Bruins, the Avalanche. I mean, here in recent years, um, they're usually the teams that make it out of there and the Capitals, obviously. But I mean, there's teams that are ahead. This year, I feel like they've all struggled to get out of the postseason. Like you mentioned, Toronto, it's like Dallas has. The Kings, obviously, a while ago were pretty good at that. But, like, I feel like here recently they've struggled uh, in the postseason. Um, so, it's kind of funny. I feel like you're getting that development this year as some of those teams. I mean, when was the last time you saw Carolina or the or New Jersey go far? Like, and those are two of the top teams in the East. So, it's just a weird year for the NHL. I feel like a lot of those top teams are teams that have struggled uh in that postseason play. Well, I think they finally found a way with the rule changes to make it more mirroring. Like the league definitely has more teams that you can consider Stanley Cup favorites this year than it did last year and the year prior, I think. So I think each year they're kind of moving forward. And along with that comes this quote from NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman on the Seattle Kraken. We were very focused on Seattle being a great opportunity, filling up the Pacific Northwest, always intrigued and excited us. So Seattle, just like Vegas, they didn't make the cup their first year, but just like Vegas, they're having a lot of success with their fan base. All of them are really gravitating to hockey there. So I think that's going to work really well as a city. Now they just got to keep building up the team. But also Seattle's not even that bad of a team this year. They might be a wild card team. So uh, they're a team that is in a good spot already. And I think they're just going to get better. And also good for Dave Haxtell. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, good, good for him. He actually proved he can coach in the league. And you brought up the wild card. And that's sort of been my final question here to you is – so right now, the two wild card spots in the East of the Islanders and Penguins at 72 and 70, 71 points. And then you have five teams, or excuse me, four teams with uh, 68 points. So sitting basically two games out of the playoffs there with about 20 games left in Buffalo, Ottawa, Florida, and Washington. Do you see any of those teams being able to overtake Pittsburgh and New York or on the East side? Or do you think New York and Pittsburgh uh, solidified that those last two? I think New York and Pittsburgh will take it because New York also just added Patrick Kane. Mm -hmm. So that's going to really help them out. Well, that, that was the Rangers, wasn't it? Or is that the Islanders? Oh, oh, you're talking about the Islanders. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Sorry, the Islanders are 72 points in the wild card. The Rangers have 79 and have that third spot in the Metro, so they don't have to worry about the wild card. The Islanders I don't trust. So the Islanders I could see losing their spot more than Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh is experienced mm – -hmm. Until basically, I say this every year until Crosby, Latang, and Malkin aren't together, it's 
they're going to make the postseason. Like that, that's just how Pittsburgh is. If they have those guys together, they're going to make the postseason. Even though in my season, I'm ten and zero without Evgeny Malkin, and I just have Sidney Crosby. But that's just my season in NHL because I'm great. <laughs> um, of course. But so, here's the tricky part with the Islanders too. They already have 65 games played with 72 points. Buffalo's got 68, so they're four points behind, but they've only played 61 games. So they got four games in hand. Same thing with the Ottawa Senators, who are on a five game win streak, starting to play the best hockey at the right time. They've only played 61 games as well. So they got four games in hand, too. So say they just win two of those games, you create a tie. That's true. Yeah, I didn't look at it that way. Yeah, that's, that's true. Something that's something that, that I always pay attention to, or try to at least, because. Buffalo and Ottawa, they got more time to make up ground where New York's already got those four games played. So it's kind of weird that this late in the season, they've got four more games played already. But that also does mean Buffalo and Ottawa probably have a couple more back to backs. Um, yeah. It could be tired. So, all right. Well, now we'll pass the torch over to Andrew because Andrew's our basketball expertise guy on the show. So to talk about the NBA, I'll pass the leading torch over to. Andrew, where the Sixers were able to come back and win that ball game yesterday um, due to big part of Joe Embiid continuing to be a beast from that foul line interior shot that he has going now, that little Kobe fadeaway he has going from the foul line. um, That's been very impressive for me. But uh, if you have any other teams you want to talk about in the Sixers, go ahead and now because I'm going to let you lead the basketball at the fence. Hey, we're starting to hit a a down the stretch time here for the NBA Sixers. I don't know. Sixers are a weird team. Uh, when you're ready to kind of count them out, and you think, okay, they're just pretenders. They come out and get the big win against the Bucks, and then they'll turn around and lose a tough game. Um, so the Sixers are a weird team. I, I really don't know what to expect from them come playoff time. Um, you had a game against the Celtics the other day in Philadelphia, and you lost on a buzzer beater. So you played with the two, you played the two best teams in the East this past week. You lost on a buzzer beater, and then you came back and beat one on the road. So you obviously can play with those two teams, and it's going to come down to and beat and Harden, who we both seen kind of shy away sometimes in the, in the postseason. Um, Harden, I think, had what one shot in the second half of that big uh, elimination game last year to the Heat. Um, so he, he came up small there. So it, it's going to take a full team effort um, for the for the Sixers um, to get get past that second round. They're going to finally get back to at minimum the Eastern Finals. And we'll see. And that, that's yeah. what it's fine when I ask for a picture because then I would be kicking myself. No, I was going to say I agree. I agree with you on all those points because you see too much lackadaisical play by the Sixers sometimes, where like. They get a lead, they get laxed, or they're too laxed early in the game, and that doesn't spell championship for me. That spells out in the second round. So that's what concerns me a little bit about the Sixers. Yeah, especially because right now, I mean, we always talk about I mean, how many years have we been saying how much better the Sixers are at home uh, than on the road? And right now you're sitting as a three seed. So if you got to go up against the Celtics or the Bucks in the playoffs, you're going to be facing them on the road. You're not going to have that home court advantage. Um, so it's going to take a lot. I will say, you, you mentioned other teams. Uh, this isn't the year for them. I'm not saying this year. But if they apply their offseason right, the New York Knicks and what they did at the trade deadline and the pending free agency this offseason, they're a team to look out for next year. They're hitting the right stride. They're on an eight-game win streak right now. I like the direction the Knicks are going. And that's the one that keeps New York. <laughs> Yeah, no. I would say my favorite for the finals is Milwaukee, honestly. For the finals, I, I hate to say it, but I have to Bucks right now. Um, obviously, it's going to – Bucks. I mean, you can't go wrong with Bucks. Even Sixers, I mean, Sixers are the three best. Um, I do think it's going to be tough to beat out one of them on the road. But Jason Tatum and Jason Brown has been a phenomenal duo. And the Bucks' health has kind of scared me. We've seen Giannis miss time. We've seen Hilton miss time. We've even seen Holiday miss some time. So that's what's going to come down the big for the Bucks is can they stay yeah. healthy? Uh, <laughs> right now, unfortunately, because I do hey, actually – Unfortunately, the Celtics are my favorite. Out in the West, 
the West is up for grabs. I, I think with Durant playing yes. out, I think I'm going to go Suns as my favorite to get to the finals. Um, I think he makes that much. You stole, yeah, you stole my team. So, yeah, I agree with you on that. Even with them as the four seed right now, I think they'll get there. Um, I mean, now Memphis was without John Morant for at least the next two games. So, we'll see how long that goes. It's dealing with some off-the-court stuff. Um, so, we'll see how that gets handled. But how about the Kings? What a fun year they've had. She talks about them kind of being bad and that young team hopefully soon coming up. And they're playing phenomenal this year, obviously. Uh, it's their first year up there, so I don't think it'll carry them to the playoffs or carry them through the playoffs. It might take them a year or two. But Just an fun. FYI, we have a seven minute warning. Okay. Bears. But um, yeah, my, my favorite for the, my favorites for the finals would be Sun Celtics right now. Hopefully, obviously, I'm wrong. I want the Sixers to get there. Mine's Buck. Mine's Bucks and Suns. Do you go Suns for the win or the Bucks for the win? I think I go Suns over Celtics. So- I would go the Suns for the win if it ends up Suns Bucks because the Bucks might be too banged up, like you said. They keep getting injuries this year, but they keep fighting through them. But eventually, they catch up to you. But as we wrap up this video in the final six minutes, I did forget to mention Patrick Brown got traded for a sixth round pick. Uh, Zach McEwen got traded for a fifth round pick, and now we have Brendan the Mew, who is. I believe Claude Lemieux's son. Uh, and he's just a tough guy. So Tortorella added the one guy, he another, like, DeLaurier, basically, uh, to the team. So he's supposed to debut tonight, so check him out tonight um, at 6 o'clock for some reason on NBC Sports Philadelphia. Don't ask me why they put the game at 6 and not 7. But it's at 6 o'clock for some reason on NBC Sports Philadelphia. So check that out. Or if you're not in the area, it's also the NHL Network game of the week. So uh, they have it on NHL Network for people that um, don't get NBC Sports Philadelphia. But we get everything because we have one of those boxes that give you everything. So even if I couldn't watch it on the TV, I could just go on that like jailbroken box and then – Watch from Canada station. <laughs> but as we wrap up, I did want to mention the Eagles and how successful of a season they had. Yes, they lost by three in the Super Bowl, but let's be honest. Jalen Hurts balled out in the Super Bowl minus that fumble. Uh, and it wasn't a butt fumble, so it was an actual fumble. So he's got that going for him. Um and I think they're moving exactly in the right direction. I, If I had to predict back-to-back appearances, I would predict that right now because I think Nick Sirianni is a head coach. I don't know how I got this scratch on my I think Nick Sirianni is a great coach, and Jalen Hurts is an MVP in the making. So – Having a great coach with a MVP in the making quarterback typically spells you're going to get back to the Super Bowl. Plus, once you got there, it's like they said about the Phillies yesterday on the Phillies telecast, you're hungry for more. So that's kind of my wrap-up point of the podcast. I think the Eagles are in a perfect spot, and they're just going to add more this offseason because we know Howie, now that Jeffrey Lurie took a step back, it was actually Jeffrey Lurie that was holding Howie back. Yeah, I think the Eagles are in a tremendous spot, like you just mentioned. I mean, I, I think they have to be one of the favorites to get back, especially when you're coming in with two first-round draft picks, including a top-ten pick. Not many teams, whether you win or lose, that went to the Super Bowl are coming back with a top-ten draft pick. Whether you keep it or trade it, you still got that leverage. Um, obviously, you have a lot to fill in the agency. Hopefully, you bring a lot of these guys back. But like you said, you have Jalen Hurts, Nick Sirianni, and you still have A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith. So you still got his two favorite targets. And you still have Dallas Goddard. Um, and yeah. you still have Lane Johnson. So there's no reason not to believe he can get back. And for right now, you still have Jason Kelsey because it's not like you retired yet. Yeah, I, I didn't want to say that yet because I didn't know. So, but, um, you know, you still have Kelsey. Obviously, Miles Sanders is a question mark. Um, we'll see if they bring him back. But let's – Kenneth Gainwell balled out in the playoffs. He had the 100-yard game. Yeah. So, if he's going to be one of your featured backs next year, I don't think that's a problem with the throw line. No, I don't think so either. 
But that about wraps us up for today. This was what we're going to be doing every Sunday now. We're going to be doing a little all sports for you. I'll be pulling from this Futures magazine to just open to a random page like I just did right now, the Kraken, and then we could talk about Shane Wright. So we'll do that one next episode. We'll do the Seattle Kraken and talk about Shane Wright as their top prospect. But we thank you all for joining us. This has been the Sports Fag News Sportscast, Sports Center of the likes of the radio version. Um, I hope you all do well this Sunday. Stay blessed and be safe. Um, Andrew, did you have any closing remarks? Oh, yeah, it's it's exciting time. Philly's right around the corner. Sixers coming down to the playoff stretch and uh, something we can talk about here in the next few weeks. March Madness is coming up in, in the blink of an eye. So a lot of fun stuff in the sports world. And uh, everybody enjoy and yeah, stay safe and have a great week. See you next weekend. Stop recording.